Chapter 15, Poole's story. I must ask you to remain quiet, sir, Poole whispered as they walked. I think it would be best if I didn't, if he didn't know you were here. Listen, listening would be best. I understand, Utterson said. It was hard for the lawyer to keep his hand from shaking. Candle wax dripped on his hand, but he made no noise. He followed Poole to the top of the laboratory stairs. The butler indicated that he should stand to one side and listen. He took a deep breath and knocked with a somewhat uncertain hand on the door. Sir, Poole called through the door. Mr. Utterson is here to see you. A voice answered from within. Tell him I cannot see him anymore, it said shakily. Thank you, sir, Poole answered. He seemed pleased with the voice's response. He started back down the stairs. Utterson followed behind him. When they were once again in the courtyard, Poole turned back to the lawyer. Now, tell me, sir, Poole said, was that my master's voice? It seems much changed, answered Utterson, very pale. Well, I certainly think so, said, butler, said the butler. Could I work in this house for 20 years and not know my master's voice? No, sir, that voice is not my master's. Something has happened to him, or he has been taken away. It has been eight days now, and I'm at my wit's end. This is very strange, Poole. It is a rather wild tale, my man, Utterson said. Suppose you were right and Dr. Jekyll has been murdered or kidnapped. Why would the culprit stay in the room? Why wouldn't he escape? You're a hard man to satisfy, Mr. Utterson, but I'll do my best to convince you, Poole said. All this past week, he, or whatever it is locked in that office, has been crying all night and, and day for special medicine. He writes orders for medicine on notes and leaves them on the stairs. This perhaps has con was continued all this week. Not just one or two notes, but dozens. I've traveled to pharmacies across the city, filled these orders and sending complaints. You see, every time I returned with the medicine, I was told it was not pure. I was told to return it and go and get another pharmacy. I have no idea what the medicine is, but he is desperate. Do you have any of these notes? Utterson asked. Poole reached into a pocket and pulled out a crumpled piece of paper. The lawyer bent over his candle and carefully examining the writing. It read as follows. I return this medicine purchased from your firm. It is not pure and there is, for it is useless to me. I purchased a large quantity some years ago. I am des in desperate need to refill this order. I must ask you to carefully search your supplies to find pure and proper sample. I cannot stress enough the importance of this order. It was the last line of the note that disturbed Utterson the most. There was a sudden splash of ink as the author's emotions became too strong. I beg you, the note read, please find the medicine of old. This is a strange note, Utterson said. Why is it open? The lawyer asked rather sharply. It seems that Utterson would defend his friend Jekyll to the end, even though he realized Poole was only trying to help. He was suspicious that Poole opened private notes. One of the pharmacists was so angry that he threw it back at me, Poole said. Do you recognize this as Dr. Jekyll's handwriting? Utterson asked. It does look like it, Butler said rather sulkily. But what does that matter when I've seen the man who wrote this? Poole blurted out. Seen him, Utterson said. Where, when? I stepped into the garden unexpectedly, Poole said. He must have come out to look for the delivery of medicine. I saw him standing in the other end of the courtyard through the crates. When he saw me, he let a sharp cry and ran back up the stairs. I only saw him for a few minutes, but my blood ran cold at the sight of him. My hair practically stood on end. Sir, if that was my master, why did he scream out like a rat and run off? Poole passed his hand over his face in great despair. There are several very strange stories, Utterson said but I think I'm beginning to see the light. Your master must be suffering from some sort of strange breakdown. That would explain the change in his voice and avoiding his friends. He must believe that this mysterious medicine will cure him of the sickness. I do hope he is right in the matter and we can cure him. Sir, said the butler, the creature in that office is not my master and that is that. He looked around him and then began to whisper, my master is tall, well-built man. Well, this person is much shorter and rather stooped. Do you think after all these years, I wouldn't notice where my master's head comes to the doorway? Do you think I would not recognize his footsteps? No, sir. That thing was not, is not Dr. Jekyll. I believe my, my master has been murdered. Poole, the lawyer said, are you quite certain that you believe this? 
Utterson broke into a sweat. It was an unbearable thought that his oldest and dearest friend was murdered. The butler nodded slowly. We have only one option then. We must break down the door, Utterson said. Chapter 16, The Other Side of the Door. The butler agreed at once. Ah, oh, Mr. Utterson, that's talking, he cried. How should we go about this, Utterson asked. We should arm ourselves. We should know we might, we should never know what we might find inside. The butler nodded. There's a croquet mallet in the shed. May I suggest you take the fireplace poker, sir? Utterson thought for a moment that he might laugh. Tensions were high. It was hard to believe that he was in this situation. It felt like a passage from an adventure novel. Utterson could say without a doubt that he had never had an experience like this before. It was certainly not how he pictured this evening or the fate of his good friend, Dr. Jekyll. Do you realize, Poole, he said, that we are about to put ourselves in a situation of some danger? You may say so, sir, indeed, returned the butler. We should be completely honest with one another right now, said Arson. Do you recognize that man you saw in the car courtyard? It's hard to say. I, it all happened so quickly, and he was doubled over when I saw him, so I can't say for certain, Poole said. But if you're asking me whether or not it was Mr. Hyde, well, I'd have to say yes. It looked very much like him. I hate to think it, but it is true. Have you ever met Mr. Hyde? Poole asked the lawyer. Yes, Utterson said. I spoke with him once. Then you know the response Mr. Hyde brings out in people. I know it well, Utterson replied. He literally sent shivers up my spine. I realize that isn't proof, Poole whispered. But when I saw the creature going through the crates, I had the same reaction. I went cold at the sight of him. Ah, Patterson sighed. I fear that you may be right. If it was Mr. Hyde that you saw, then Henry Jekyll must surely be dead. Well then, let's get at it. The lawyer's heart sank. His hope of finding his friends safe and sound was quickly fading. Perhaps you should call the footman, Bradshaw, to stand guard, Patterson suggested. We may need extra help. Poole agreed and ran back into the house. Bradshaw arrived a few minutes later pale and nervous. Another, although the, a large man, he was clearly frightened. He was sweating and nervously shifting from one foot to the other. He put his hands in his pockets so the other men wouldn't see them shaking. Pull yourself together, Bradshaw, Utterson said. Poole and I are going to break down this office door. We don't know what we might find or what might happen. There's a chance that the culprit may try to escape. Would you please stand guard by the door? Bradshaw nodded. Fine, we'll give you a few minutes to get there. Utterson shook Bradshaw's hand before the footman walked off. The two men remained in silence. Utterson looked into the night sky, admiring the stars and heavens. It really is quite remar remarkable, he thought. Life can provide so many twists and turns, but the stars are always beautiful. After a few minutes, Utterson took a deep breath. And now, Poole, we must be off to our task, Utterson said. The men walked across the courtyard, their candles flickering in the wind. As they walked up the stairwell, they could hear the pacing across the office floor. It's like this day and night, Poole said. The only time the pacing stops is when the new medicine arrives. Then, as soon as he realized the batch isn't right, the pacing starts again. This is all you hear? asked Utterson. Once I heard weeping, sir, Poole said. Weeping like a woman or a lost soul. The two men gathered up their nerve outside the office door. Utterson grasped the fire poker in both hands and shouted, Jekyll, he said in a loud voice. I demand to see you. He paused a moment, but there was no reply. I've given you fair warning. We must and shall see you, he resumed. If not by fair means, then by foul. If not with your consent, then by brute force. Utterson, the voice said, please have mercy. Oh, that's not Jekyll's voice. It's Hyde's, cried Utterson. Down with the door, pool. Poole used an axe to ram the door hinges. The first strike let out a cr loud crash. The second and third strikes moved the door slightly, and a horrible screeching sound was heard from within, like an animal under attack. Utterson and Poole looked at one another knowingly. They returned to the door with renewed force and determination. It was not until the fifth strike that the door came crashing down. The two men peered into the room, afraid of what they might see. They were surprised to see a room full of fire and warmth. 
A kettle was boiling over the flames and dishes were laid out for tea. There was a blanket on a chair and a book open on the table as though someone had recently been sitting there. Some drawers in the cabinet were open and papers were neatly piled on top of the desk. It would have looked like the most common room in London, except for the many chemicals and medicines among the shelves and the body lying on the rug. Chapter 17, Inside the Lab. Utterson and Poole tiptoed closer to the body. They turned it over and found the face of Edward Hyde. He was dressed in clothes far too large for him. These clothes clearly belonged to Dr. Jekyll. Hyde was dead. His lifeless hand still clutched an empty vial. Utterson knew that it had once contained poison. This was clearly a case of suicide. We've come too late, Utterson said. Hyde is gone and we'll never have answers. The lawyer looked up at the butler. Now it only remains for us to find the body of your master. The two men started their search for Dr. Jekyll. They began with the office, then worked their way down the staircase and through the car yard. There were many dark closets and a large cellar to search through. All were carefully examined. Most of these hiding spaces had not been visited in years. The dust along the walls and cobwebs told them that no one else had passed that way. They found no tra trace of Dr. Henry Jekyll, dead or alive. Perhaps we're wrong, Utterson said. Maybe he escaped. He went to check the back door. It was locked. They found the key lying on the ground nearby. It was already stained with rust. This doesn't look like it's been used in a while, observed the lawyer. Used, he echoed, by, echoed the butler. Do not see, sir, it is broken. It looks like someone had crushed it underfoot. Yes, continued Utterson, I think you're right. The two men looked at each other with frightened stares. This is beyond me, the lawyer said. They walked back up the stairs in silence. Each man was deep in thought. They began to think, to look through the contents of the office more closely. They both tried not to look at Hyde's body on the rug. Hyde must have been mixing chemicals together on one of the side tables. They found several measuring glasses of salt and other chemicals. Utterson guessed that it had interrupted Hyde in the middle of an experiment. This is the same drug that I was bringing him, said Poole. Was Mr. Hyde performing the same experiments as Dr. Jekyll? Maybe the medicine was from Mr. Hyde all along. The two men suddenly noticed that the kettle was boiling and overflowing. They were so absorbed in their work that they hadn't had noticed little else. Poole removed the kettle from the heat. Utterson approached the easy chair where the dishes for the tea were laid out. He noticed the book on the side table. It was a copy of a religious text that Jekyll often spoke of. There was writing along the margins. Utterson was shocked by what he read. It appeared to be in Jekyll's handwriting, but the words seemed so unlike the doctor's. A full-length mirror stood in the center of the room. It had a large wooden frame with its own stand. There was glass on both sides. Mr. Utterson spun the mirror by holding the top and turning it over. Would, why would Jekyll want a mirror in his office, he asked. I have no idea, sir, Poole said. I've never seen it before. They turned their attention to the desk. Among the neat array of papers, Utterson found an envelope addressed to him. It was in Dr. Jekyll's handwriting. The lawyer unsealed it and several other envelopes fell out. The first was a will. It contained the same strange terms that the one that sat in Utterson's safe. On this one, however, the lawyer, lawyer was listed as the heir rather than Edward Hyde. Utterson looked at Poole, back in the paper, then finally at the body on the floor. I'm completely confused, Poole, Utterson said. He's barely spoken with me in recent times. I'm, I'm shocked by this change. Utterson picked up another paper. It was a note written in the doctor's hand and dated that day. Oh, Poole, he cried. He was alive and here this very day. He must have fled, but why? Why don't we read it, sir? Poole said. Utterson took a deep breath and read the note aloud. My dear Mr. Utterson, when this note falls into your hands, I will have disappeared. Under what circumstances, I cannot say. I am certain, however, that it will happen very soon, and it will be some method of evil. Please go and read the letter that Lanyon sent you before his death. If you still wish to hear more, open the third envelope. Your unworthy and unhappy friend, Henry Jekyll. Poole handed Utterson the last envelope. It was very thick and sealed in several places. The lawyer put the package in his pocket. Please say nothing about this paper. If your master has fled or is dead, we may at least save his honor. It is 10 o'clock. I must go home and read this document in quiet. I shall be back here before midnight when we shall send for the police. They left the office. 
Poole made certain the door from the house to the courtyard was locked, so no one would wander back that way. Please tell Bradshaw to remain at his post, Utterson said. Dr. Jekyll may yet return, and we don't want to miss him. Utterson passed the servants, still huddled by the great fire in the front room. They looked silently at him as he passed. He let himself out the front door and made his way home. Chapter 18, a letter from Dr. Jekyll. Utterson took the envelope out of his safe. He sat down heavily and began to read Dr. Lanyon's story. Four days ago, on January 9th, I received an evening delivery of a registered envelope. It was from my old friend, Dr. Henry Jekyll. I was very surprised by this, as he has never exchanged letters before. I had seen him the night before and did not expect contact so soon. I could not imagine what could be so important. My curiosity grew after reading the letter. It read as follows. Dear Lanyon, you are one of my oldest friends. Although we have had our differences of late on scientific matters, I cannot remember any break in our affection. I am certain that you know I would never think twice about coming to your rescue. At the moment's notice, I would be at your side. Lanyon, my life, my honor, and my reason are all at your mercy. If you fail me tonight, I am lost. You might suspect that I am about to ask you to do something shameful. Judge for yourself. I ask that you put everything aside tonight, even if an emergency should arise, and bring this letter to my house. My butler has his orders. You will find him waiting with a locksmith. I need you to break into my office. Once the door is open, you should enter alone. Remove the far left drawer of the medicine cabinet. You will find it filled with some powders and vials. I am in such a state of panic and worry that I may misdirect you in some way. Therefore, please take the entire drawer and all its contents with you. Take it back to your home. I will send someone to get it. I am concerned about timing. If you leave for my home immediately after receiving this letter, then you should be home well before midnight. There is also a chance that you will be delayed in some way, so allowing you this extra time is best. I ask that you please be alone at midnight. No servants can be nearby. At midnight, then, I ask that you admit a man who will present himself in my name. Please give him the drawer that you have removed from my office. Your work will be done at this point. If you choose to have further explanation, all will be revealed in the next five minutes. The mere thought of you refusing my request is too much to bear. My mind reels and I am thrown into fits of panic. Think of me in this hour, in a strange place, full of despair. I know that I am asking a lot of you but your willingness to help has done wonders for my spirits. Your friend, Henry. This letter convinced me that Dr. Jekyll was insane. However, I could take no chances. I knew that I must fulfill his wishes. I was not in a position to judge, since I did not know all of the details. And in the end, the most important fact was that a friend was in great need. Therefore, I did as the letter asked and went directly to Jekyll's home. His butler was waiting for me with the locksmith. He also had received a letter by registered mail from Jekyll. We immediately went to work. It took some time, but the locksmith was at a long last successful. The door to the office swung open. I pulled the second drawer from the left as Jekyll requested. Once I had returned home, I examined the drawer's contents. It was full of powders and vials, just as he had said it would be. It was plain to me that these chemicals were of Jekyll's own making. I recognized none of them. The powder appealed to be some form of salt. The vials were full of red liquid. It had a very strong odor, almost sickly sweet. I could make no guess at the name of the other chemicals. It was all very strange. The only thing to do now was to wait. Eventually, this man would come to pick up the drawer. I could not understand what these chemicals had to do with the safety and sanity of Jekyll. All of this convinced me, more than ever, that Jekyll was insane. I sent my servants to bed and waited in my lab for, midnight, for my midnight visitor. Chapter 19, A Visit from a Stranger. The bells had barely struck 12 o'clock, when the stranger appeared at my door, I asked if Dr. Jekyll had sent him. He said yes, so I asked him inside. He looked behind him to make sure that no one saw him from the street. A policeman passed my house moments later. I noticed that this man watched at the window until the officer was gone. These details had me worried. I wondered what kind of man Jekyll had sent to my house. I thought it best to get this nasty task over with as soon as possible. I led him into my study where I had left the drawer. It I took a good look at this man. He was short and wore a heavy coat. It was his face that was most striking, though. The word I can use is horrible. It made my heart skip a beat at first glance. I was, however, curious. Perhaps it is because I'm a doctor, but I could not look away. Why did his physical appearance affect me so strongly? These observations had taken some time to write down, but they covered mere seconds in real lifetime. 
We moved quickly from hall to the study as my visitor was very anxious to get the drawer. Have you got it? He cried. Have you got it? He was so impatient that he stared to shake me, started to shake me. I pushed him back a step or two. Come, sir, I said. You forget that I have not yet had the pleasure of meeting you. Be seated, if you please. I sat down myself, doing my best to appear natural. I'm not certain why I delayed giving him the medicine. My curiosity got the best of me, I suppose. I wanted to see how he would react. I beg your pardon, Dr. Lanyon, he replied civilly enough. I realize I'm impatient, but I come at a request of your good friend, Dr. Jekyll. I would not like to keep him waiting. He paused and put his hand to his throat. I could see that in spite of his collected manner, he was close to tears. I understand that I am to retrieve a drawer, he sputtered. I took pity on my visitor. Not perhaps, no, perhaps I was more interested in satisfying my own curiosity. It is hard to say at this point with the information I now possess. There it is, I said, pointing to the drawer where it lay on the floor. He sprang to it, then he paused and laid his hand upon his heart. I could hear his teeth grinding with nerves. He plucked away the sheet. At the sight of the contents, he uttered a sob of such great relief that I sat terrified. I was in shock when he spoke a moment later, asking for an, a measuring glass. I rose from my place with something of an effort and gave him what he asked for. He thanked me with a smiling nod. He then proceeded to measure out a dose of the red liquid with strange salts. As the ingredients came together, the mixture took on a bright color. It started to bubble and smoke. Then it turned a dark, rich purple and stopped churning. At last, it slowly faded to a watery green color. My visitor watched each stage with a keen eye. He smiled and set the glass on the table. He then turned and looked at me sternly. And now, he said, you will be wise. Will you ask me to leave your house with this glass without further discussion, or are you too, too curious now? Think carefully before you decide. If you choose, I can leave, and you will be neither richer nor wiser from the experience. Or I can stay, and a new world of understanding will be opened up to you, a world you can hardly imagine at this point. Sir, I said, attempting to sound cool and calm, although I was far from either. It was clear that he was challenging me, asking if I was brave enough to see the story through. I've gone too far, far in this strange business to turn back now. I must see the end. Very well, he said. Only keep your vows in mind. Remember that I gave you every opportunity to stay out of this. You have lived by such narrow lanes for so long that you cannot understand the areas of science and wonder that surround you. Look. He put the glass to his lips and drank it in one gulp. A cry followed. He reeled, staggered, clutched to the table, and held on, staring with dazed eyes as I looked. A change came over him. He seemed to swell. His face began to alter. In the next moment, I had sprung to my feet and leapt back against the wall. My arm was raised to shield me from the sight. My mind was swimming with terror. No, no, I screamed again and again, for there before my eyes, pale and shaken and half fainting, stood Henry Jekyll. What he told me in the next hour, I cannot bring myself to repeat. I saw what I saw, I heard what I heard, and my soul is sickened by it. Yet now, that he is now before me, I wonder if it was true. It seems far too strange. I cannot answer. My life is shaken to its root. Sleep has left me. The deadliest terror sits by me at all hours of the night and day. Every no noise makes me jump. I am frightened of shadows and darkness. I feel my days are numbered. I must die. Jekyll claimed regret and sorrow. Even he shed tears, but I doubt whether that would be enough. I will say but one thing, Utterson, and that will be more than enough. The creature who crept into my house that night was, by Jekyll's own confession, known by the name of Hyde and hunted in every corner of the land as the murderer of Sir Danvers Carew. Chapter 20. A Transformation. Utterson put down Lanyon's letter and turned to the last envelope. He held it in his hands a few moments before opening it. He knew this letter would be his final contact with Henry Jekyll. He was curious and worried what, by what his friend would have to say. Utterson slowly opened the envelope, unfolded the thick stack of papers, and began to read. I was born to a large fortune. I had a love of industry and study and enjoyed the company of friends. All indications were that my life would be blessed with a good fortune and promise. No one doubted that I was headed towards a great career. Indeed, my own fault was my rather free-spirited nature. It was always a great difficulty for me to hide my joy of life and display a more noble outlook. 
According to my family, it was considered impolite to appear too lively, too enthusiastic. I learned to hide my pleasures. I was one person when, when with my family and someone else when on my own. It wasn't until I was in my mid-twenties that I took stock of my surroundings and realized I was leading a double life. Some men might have bragged about their exploits, but I saw them as shameful secrets. I took great pains to hide them from the world. Over time, I succeeded in dividing the two sides of my nature, the good and the evil. I was in no sense a liar, as both sides of me were true. I was entirely myself when engaging in some shameful activity, just as I was entirely myself while living a good and clean life. My scientific studies centered on the dual nature of man, that we can be both good and bad. I assumed that there was a logical and chemical reason for the division. It must be a part of our physical makeup. Why is one person blonde and the other brunette? Why are some people tall and others short? There must be a similar reason to explain the goods and bad parts of mankind. I was my own lab experiment. Every day I felt a draw, drawing closer to understanding this division. It was my strong belief that man is not one but two, two persons in one. I am certain that other scientists will follow and discover that there are, are in fact even more than two. For now though, I must stick with what I know to be true. During my studies and experiments, I have been become, I became convinced that this dual nature could be separated. I told myself that if each side of a person could be divided into separate identities, life would be easier. The evil could go in one direction and the good in the other. We would recognize early from easily from one from the other. There would be no more uncertainty or confusion. That these two opposing forces trapped within the same body had already caused too much pain. My next question was, how could I separate them? I will not go into the exact scientific details of my discovery for two reasons. First, I believe that it is too dangerous to pass on such information. We are all naturally curious and I would not want anyone to else to be harmed. Second, as you would soon learn from my confession, my discoveries were incomplete. Needless to say, after much experimenting and trial and error, I discovered what I thought to be the perfect combination. I waited some time before I put this theory into practice. I knew well that I risked death. Any drug, that shakes the very idea of who we are must be dangerous, but my curiosity was too great. Any concerns I had were overcome by my intense desire to learn something new. I purchased a large quantity of a particular salt from a wholesale company. I knew this salt was the last piece to the puzzle. Late one night, I put all the elements together in a measuring glass. I watched it as it bubbled, smoked, and boiled. It changed color several times before turning a watery pale green. Taking a deep breath for courage, I swallowed the potion quickly. The pain and sickness surprised me. I found myself rolling on the floor in agony. I felt certain that I had done myself serious harm. Then, quite suddenly, the pain stopped. I felt perfectly fine. I stood up and realized I felt lighter, healthier, younger than I had in years. I had a strange feeling of restlessness. New, strange, and dare I say, wicked images flashed through my mind. I believe wicked is the right word to use here. I felt positively wicked and free from any duty. I stretched out my arms and noticed for the first time that I was even shorter. Somehow I had shrunk during my transformation. My clothes were all too big for me now. I had become Mr. Edward Hyde. Chapter 21, A New Perspective. I had no mirror in the lab. I eventually installed one in my office so I could watch the transformation. The first night, however, I had to sneak inside my own house. As I skulked across the courtyard, I noticed that the sky was full of stars. It occurred to me that in all of their million of years of existence, they had never looked down on such a being like me before. I also knew that if my servants found me wandering through the corridors, they would summon the police. Looking into a hall mirror, I saw a dried up and ugly face. I wondered if the evil in a man's soul could affect the face so strongly. My first guess was yes. There could be no other explanation for Hyde's awful appearance. It would seem that my evil side was not as developed as my good side. Of course, this only makes sense, since I had never allotted time to grow or exercise. I had spent most of my life hiding it away, keeping it locked up and quiet. I wasn't disgusted, though. I recognized the reflection in the mirror as me. It was still me that I was looking at. It, this was unlike anything else, anyone else's reaction. Every single person, even you, my good friend Anderson, jumped back when he saw Edward Hyde. I think this is because people are used to looking at a person with both good and evil inside them, the dual nature I spoke of. But Edward Hyde, he was like no other. He was pure evil. It was only then that the horrible thought occurred to me. What if I could not revert to my other self? I raced back to my laboratory. Quickly, I prepared the mixture again and drank it down. Again, I was struck by terrible pains and spasms. When I recovered, I was relieved that I had returned to the body of Dr. Jekyll. Please believe me that my plans were noble. 
I approached this experience with purely, purely scientific motives. But once I had reached a crossroads, I, crossroad, I couldn't turn back. Something was unleashed in me. Perhaps it was simple curiosity. I'm afraid I don't really even know myself. Once I had discovered Mr. Hyde, he demanded to be let out more and more. He began to take root in the rest of my life. This change didn't happen overnight. I was still involved in my studies. I still saw friends and associates. Over time, though, I could feel Mr. Hyde growing in strength. He was developing rapidly. I was intrigued at first, but Mr. Hyde's presence was to become unwelcome. I was obsessed by this power, knowing that with a quick drink of potion, I could switch between the bodies of an evil villain and a gentleman doctor. It was too much for one man. It became a form of torture. It became more and more difficult for me to meet with others. I let friendships slip away. Only my servants kept me company. Hyde, on the other hand, was not hidden away. He lived a life among thieves and monsters. This was a perfect company for Mr. Hyde. I, or perhaps I should say Hyde, rented that room in Soho. It was a place for him to stay in comfort and do whatever business he saw fit. In the meantime, I told all of my servants to admit Hyde into the house. I drew up the will that bothered you so much. I worried that sometime something might happen to my Jekyll side. I wanted Hyde to be with, didn't want Hyde to be without money. Once I thought all the sides had been taken care of, I actually began to enjoy the freedom, Mr. Hyde. Hyde could do anything he liked and no one would blame Jekyll. Hyde could commit unspeakable, awful acts, but it would never be the fault of Dr. Jekyll. There were times when I, as Jekyll, tried to repair the damage done by Mr. Hyde. So I was not without feelings. Your cousin Enfield may have told you about this Hyde causing the injury to a young girl. I paid her family a large sum of money. I know that the check couldn't could not undo the harm, but it was all I could do I felt that was necessary. For the most part, though, I turned a blind eye. The Uncomfortable Mr. Hyde, Uncontrollable Mr. Hyde, Chapter 22. Two months before the murder of Sir Danvers, I returned from one of Hyde's adventures. I switched back to Dr. Jekyll and went to bed. I woke up with a very odd feeling. I recognized the room around me as my own, but something was wrong. I felt as though I was not in the right place. I lay on my bed wondering about this situation. I was convinced that there must be some logical and scientific answer to my discomfort. I was deep in thought when I noticed my hand. It was not the hand of Dr. Jekyll. It was thin with sharp knuckles. It was the hand of Hyde. I must have started, stared at that hand for nearly a minute. I was so caught up in the wonder of it all. When it finally all came together for me, I jumped out of bed and ran into the mirror. I could not believe my eyes. Yes, I had gone to bed as Henry Jekyll and woken as Edward Hyde. How could this have happened? The next, perhaps, was more immediate, important question. How could this be remit remedied? It was mid-morning. All the servants were up and the medicine was in the laboratory. Yet there was no way I could walk across the courtyard to get it. I would be able to cover my face, but that would not disguise me enough. Thankfully, I took a breath and realized that my servants were already used to Hyde's coming and going. I dressed quickly and left the room. I passed Bradshaw, the footman, who was taken aback by the presence of Hyde so early in the day. My loose-fitting clothes must have also caught his eye. I knew that I would not be able to continue with my devil life. I was losing control over it. I was too developed now. I suspected that he had actually grown in strength. I had changed from Jekyll to Hyde without taking the medicine. My mind or body, I don't know which, switched on its own. The medicine was already losing its power. I had to drink three times as much medicine to switch back and forth. When I started this experiment, it was difficult to leave the Dr. Jekyll side behind. Now it was quite the opposite. The events of that morning confirmed that it was now more difficult to lose Mr. Hyde. It was clear that I was losing hold of my original and better self. My evil criminal side was becoming too strong. I knew that I must choose between the two. Jekyll was worried and curious about Hyde's actions and well-being. Hyde was completely indifferent to Jekyll. Losing Hyde meant losing certain evils that I had grown to enjoy, but leaving Jekyll meant that I would be friendless and hated by all. I knew I could not live by that outcome. So I left Hyde behind. I still kept the apartment in Soho and Hyde's clothes hung in the closet of my laboratory, but I did not use the medicine. For two months, I lived a quiet and careful life. And I was happy with this life for a while. My conscience was clear, but my the desires and instincts were not gone, only resting. I once again found myself mixing, then drinking the potion. My devil had been long caged. Hyde arrived with a roar and a fury that I had not expected. Even while I was drinking the potion, I knew the time would be different. I knew that Hyde wanted to make up for lost time, and it was this state that Hyde came upon Sir Danvers in the laneway. My memory of the event is weak. Hyde was in a blind rage. It all happened so quickly. I am to blame for all of this. 
because it was Hyde who performed this awful deed, but please, please believe that is not something Jekyll would have even considered. I knew that my life was over at that moment too. Hyde or I fled from the scene. I ran to the apartment in Soho. I burned all my papers to destroy any evidence, and I started to roam the streets of London. Hyde contemplated other murders he would like to perform. Now that he had the taste of one, I feared he would not stop. As soon as I became Jekyll again, I fell to my knees and begged God for mercy. I knew that he, there could be no more Hyde. Making this final decision felt like freedom. I hadn't even realized how much it felt like a prison. To make sure that I wouldn't be tempted and Hyde would not be able to walk through that back door, I broke the lock. Then I crushed the gate key underfoot. I learned the next day that my own maid was a witness to the murder. I was horrified to hear Hyde named as the killer. I hadn't even realized it was Sir Danvers that I met in the alley. Hyde's fury was so strong that my Jekyll side was completely overwhelmed. My evil, Mr. Hyde, had co complete control over my body and mind. I resolved to live the life of a reformed man. I began charity work, I attended regular church services, and renewed old friendships. I returned from my solitude with full force. I was a man reborn. I felt like a miracle to be given a second chance. I had no idea it would not last. One day in early spring, I was enjoying some time on a park bench. I sat alone listening to the birds in the trees and watching the children play. I was suddenly struck by a wave of sickness and a most awful shuddering. The past, this passed away and left me faint. I felt my temperature rising. I closed my eyes, hoping this feeling would also pass. I had a sudden race of energy. I could feel myself swiftly becoming angry. I opened my eyes again. My clothes suddenly looked too big. My hands were thin and pale. I was once again Edward Hyde. I knew that I could not sit out in the open like that. Hyde was a wanted man. I also knew that I had to get out, get my medicine. I couldn't walk out the front door. Poole would call the police as soon as he saw me. That is when Dr. Vlanian came to mind. I wrote a letter and Lanyon asking him to retrieve my medicine. Lanyon said that he would write you, so I wouldn't repeat the story here. But you must understand though, I was in shock by Lanyon's reaction. I expected him to be angry, but not horrified. The fact that the shock killed him is something I will always have to live with. A new fear was starting to take hold. It was no longer simply the police I feared. It was terrified that I might be forced to live as Hyde. I hoped that I had seen the end of him. But the next day, while walking across the courtyard, I was struck by the familiar pains. I took a double dose of the medicine and returned to the body of Dr. Jekyll. Then six hours later, while I was reading by the fire, the fear came again. I drank still more. I fell asleep and woke up as Mr. Hyde. I was horrified. His terror consumed me. As Jekyll grew weaker, Hyde became stronger. It took all my strength to force Jekyll out and to take, for Hyde to take the medicine. I fear this won't be possible for much longer. My supply of salt that I used in the potion had never been refilled. During this time, I had been using the same supply. I started to search for more. I had assumed that my original batch was pure form of salt. I ther therefore began to demand from the pharmacist the purest batch, and I realized it was a mystery substance or a combination with the salt that brought on the desired effect. About a week passed since I started this letter. I am working under the influence of the last of the potion. This will most likely be the last time Henry Jekyll is allowed to speak or be heard. I must finish this letter now. I am concerned Hyde will take over before I have a chance to seal it. He will surely rip it to pieces if he sees me. This is my true hour of death. As I lay down my pen and go on to seal up my confession, I bring the life of happy Jekyll to an end and to that of Mr. Hyde. May the Lord take mercy on my soul. Dr. Henry Jekyll. The end.